kingdom of God, heaven. He says, but in one certain place, give me Psalms chapter 8, verse number 4. He says, but in one certain place, testified, saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? From this point forward, the Hebrew writer is going to focus on man. When he uses the word son of man, that is a designation used by Jesus. But in the Hebrew, son of man never referenced the Messiah. It's referencing mankind. Keep that in mind. Verse number seven. He says, thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Talking about man, not Jesus. He says, Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and did ascend him over the works of thy hands. Then the Bible goes on to say, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put them all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is put under him, but now we see not yet all these things put under him. The Lord designed mankind that man should rule everything on the earth. There was a time when every animal obeyed man. There was a time when you could walk outside and you didn't have to be worried about a snake that walked by. Did you catch that? Amen. I said a snake that walked by. I didn't say snake that walked by. Because if you remember, the Lord cursed the serpent, and he said, on your belly. Yeah. So that's a curse. Yeah. Can you imagine a snake walking down the street? <laughs> <laughs> he gave man the authority over everything that he created. He gave him glory, and he gave him honor. I'm going to show that to you. You're looking like you don't believe me. I'm going to show it in your Bible. He says in verse uh, number nine. But we see Jesus. Now he's transitioning. But we see Jesus who was made lower, a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God should taste death for every man. What the Lord said in essence then is that when God made man and man messed up, the Lord says, in order for me to reconcile man back to his former state where he was glorified, I have to send myself in the form of my son, one of the three in the Godhead, and he will come down to earth and he will take on flesh and he will die for man to bring man back to the glory he once had. Amen. I know that's a lot to digest, but I want you to meditate on that for just a moment. Then the Bible goes on to say, the Lord, Jesus Christ, tasted death. That word there suggests that he experienced the same thing you and I will experience. You know, I was watching a superhero movie I can't remember which one it was. This particular evil character came into the trailer of this particular uh, superhero. He was, he was just, he wasn't, he wasn't even like Thanos. Uh, in the Marvel uh, movie. It was similar to him, but he was going around just killing all of the other superheroes. And when he came into the locker of the young the superhero, he was dressed as a part of that. He, you know, he was trying to hide who he was. And so this evil villain came into his, his dressing room and said, are you ready to die? And, and, and the evil, uh, and the good hero, rather, he, he said, well, you know what? He said, uh, uh, I'm not scared of you. And he knew he didn't have enough power to defeat the evil hero. He said, I'm not scared of you. He said, matter of fact, I'm not scared to die. Well, what got me was what the evil hero 
He says, for it became him for whom all things, verse number 10. He says, for it became him for all whom all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Jesus Christ went through what we are going through and what we will experience through suffering. He could not do it as God the Word. The reason why Jesus has suffered is because he had to be like you and I. Amen. When you see death knocking on your door, you can stand proudly and say, I ain't scared of you. Amen. You know why? Not because of you, but because Jesus went before you. Jesus said, I will declare thy name to my brethren in the 
midst of the church, and I will sing praises unto thee. And here's what blessed my soul as well, verse number 13. This is a, I don't want to call it insignificant, but it's a point that I, that I saw. He says, and again, and again. Y'all see that in verse number 13? The word is payment in the Greek. It literally means a renewal. It means to do again. It means to, to say. He says, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Jesus Christ knew what it was to be flesh and blood, just like you and I. But this is really referring to the pain and the suffering that Jesus had to go through. Jesus says, just like you had to suffer, I had to suffer. Just like you're going through trouble, I had to go through trouble. And just like You'll die. I die. But the only difference is, I got up. And now you will too. Not because of who you are, but because of who I am. That's why it's so important, brothers and sisters, to be in Christ. Because if you're not in Christ, that is a term of what we call position. When Christ comes back and you're not in Christ, how then can you resurrect with him? Now you will resurrect. In other words, you will get up again. But the problem is, when you resurrect, there's going to be two different resurrections. Amen. That's the problem. One is going to resurrect to eternal life. And the other is going to resurrect to eternal damnation. So what you don't want to do is to resurrect and not be in Christ because you will not go to heaven because you are not in the one that is going to heaven. Let me make an analogy about that. I teach and preach. I preach across this country. New York, Phoenix, Houston, Dallas, Racine, Wisconsin. I've been, I've been in quite a few places in my, my tenure. But one of the things I've learned is that when I get the ticket, I look at the flight number. And they give me a concourse that I go down to catch the flight. Now, my ticket may have flight one, two, three, four. But if I get on a plane five, six, seven, eight, I will make my destination. If you don't get in Christ, you may take off, but you not like where you're going. Amen. Praise the Lord. Therefore, brothers and sisters, the Lord says, He says, for as much, verse 14, then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part in the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Now what the Lord is really saying is that God was the one, if you think about it this way, God is the one that calls death. The Lord says in Genesis chapter 3, he says, if you commit this sin, if you break my law, not codified, but spoken, he says, if you eat of this tree, which I told you not, he says, then you will die. The word in the Hebrew uh, some people say, well, 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 they did not instantaneously, they still live. True. But the Hebrew phrasing, the idiomatic phrasing is, dying, you shall die. What they did was the moment they violated the word of God, they began a process of dying. The minute you committed your first sin, way, way, a long time ago, I think you came from the Amen. Some of y'all been angels so long, you can't remember the sin. But the minute you committed your first sin, the Lord put you on a track of death. Give me John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I want you to start at verse 14. I'm going to read that. God put you on a track. And, and, and that track says, 
going to hell. That's the flight you got on. The minute you get into a first sin, you're like going to hell. Everybody heard about that? And it's an express flight. No stops. So, so what the Lord did was that he said, since man, the Bible says, by one man sin entered into the world, and yet by sin. He says, that one person opened the door to death. Now, everybody that sinned in the similitude of Adam dies. Well, I didn't sin like he sinned. He, yeah, he, he, you know, he, he's, a, he's a homosexual. I, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm a good person. I, I don't sin that often. God that great sin. God that great on the curve. I know you look good today, and I, I tell you, the halos look real straight. I, I, angel wings popping out behind you last night. Sin is sin. The minute you sin, God put you on that track. But look what he says in John chapter 3. Let me get there with you. Verse number, number 14. Go to verse number 14 if you don't mind. John chapter 3. Uh, verse number 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Verse number 15. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Eternal life. Verse 16. Why is that true? For God so loved the world that he gave, gift, his only begotten, one of the nace, one of the kind, that whosoever believeth in him should do what? Not perish. Now, here's the contrast comparison. If you don't believe in Christ, you will perish. Amen. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you will not perish, but you will have everlasting life. Go verse 17. For God sent not his Son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, did you see that? Yes. Might be saved. Then he goes on to say, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but contracts, denoting change. He that believeth not is what? Condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only God Son. Brothers and sisters, this is a point of driving home because Somebody here today doesn't know this. You can come to church and you can you can give, you can offer, you can you can sing songs, but if you're not in Christ, you're on that flight already. Because last I heard, I, last I read, the Bible still says, "Oh." And if you have not seen, glory to God. Glory to God. You're going to be one of the only persons with you and Jesus going to be on that one flight. But if you have, you're on the flight that you don't want to be And what you have to do to keep from perishing is to get into Christ. Is that, is that all right? Amen. I'm not telling you what I think. I'm not telling oh, see, you preaching that because you just, he just want this and yeah, I don't want anything but for you to be saved. Let's wrap this up. Go back to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, we're almost done. The Bible goes on to say, verse number 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Beautiful passage because what it's showing us is that fear brings, a death breath brings fear. Most of us are scared to die. Let's just be honest. We're just scared to die. Every time death comes into the equation, we begin to get nervous. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just scared. I don't know if I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm not, I'm not perfect enough. I haven't done enough Bible stuff. I haven't done enough this. I haven't done God says, listen, if you get a Bible study from here to the time you really die, you still will be good. The reason why most Christians live the most miserable lives, 
is because we're trying to keep every law, every now let me, let me put the court in here because I know I somebody's mind running right now. Well, you trying to say that I can see it? You trying to say I can do whatever? Well, I'm not saying that either. What I'm saying is your salvation is not based on your perfection. But your perfecting is. Amen. You need to be working to mature in Christ. But you pray a lifestyle of what we call walking in repentance and confession. What do you do? When you pray, I pray every day. Every time I get, Lord, forgive me the sins. I know I'm the ones I don't know. I'm walking in prayer. I'm praying to God every day. I don't let an hour slip my Lord, listen, I, I, I walk forgive me. That's walking in prayer. The Bible says in verse 9, he says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then the blood of Jesus Christ, watch this, continuously cleanses us. As a child of God, you've got to be invited first, but as a child of God, I have the privilege of God's blood continuously. That's the privilege I have as a child of God. But as a child of the wicked one, death is always on my doorstep. There's a story that's told about a young, young child. They had a garden in the backyard. And as some people do, they put the little gnomes and the gnomes in certain parts. And there was a little walkway. And when the child was young, the nurse, to, to keep the child within the yard, said, you see the little gnomes are? Don't walk back there. I'm something to get you. So her older brother would come out to play and they'd go in the yard and, and they would run down the walkway and they would get to a certain point and he noticed his, his, his brother would stop. And he said, he said, what's wrong, what's wrong? He said, he said, I can't go down there. He said, man, the gnomes, they get me. So his older brother looked at him. He didn't say anything. He just said, okay, I'll be back. So he walks down the dark path and skips and laughs and sings. And he comes back and skips the last and says, and says, nobody got me. He says, come on now. The younger brother saw what his older brother did and said, well, nothing happened to him. I guess nothing happened to me. He got confidence to walk down the pathway. What Jesus did for us is that the Bible says he's the finisher and the author of our faith. God said, I'm going to walk down that path. So when it's your time to walk down that path, you ain't got to be scared. Amen. Jesus said, come on, I got you now. Right on, come on, let's walk together. You see, death is not the destination, it's just the pathway. Amen. Woo. Go ahead and read my part. I'll try. Verse 1. 16 says, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels. He says, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. In other words, I didn't come to save angels. I came to save human beings. Verse 17, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to I don't have time to break that down. We'll come back this evening and we'll talk more about it. But I got to touch on this before we close. In the B clause of that passage, he says, uh, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Jesus Christ came to reconcile us back to the Father. Give for me Hebrews 9 and 5. The Lord said, I'm going to go back to make sure that I build a bridge from us to them. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to teach on this later on. I'm going to try to get to it this year. I'm going to talk about forgiveness. It's going to be a series of lessons on forgiveness. But here's the thing I want you to see. There's a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Yeah, there's a difference. The Lord says, I'm going to reconcile 
In other words, I'm going to build that bridge, not because you can't build it to me. See, whatever you tried, you couldn't do. Well, Lord, I, I killed the turtle doves, I, I slew the lamb, I killed the bullet. Yeah, but that didn't build no bridge back to me. You'll find it in Hebrews chapter 9 when we get there. The blood of bulls and goats, they couldn't do it. But in Hebrews 9, verse number 5, I want you to see what the Bible says. He says, and over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat. This is the only time you find the word mercy seat mentioned in the New Testament. In this particular passage, the word is helaskomos, helaskomos in Greek. But in Hebrews 9, 5, the word is not helaskomos, it's the cockney of helaskomos. It is hilasterion. Hilasterion literally translates mercy seat. Why is that important, preacher? Important for this reason. In the Old Testament, when they brought their sacrifice, the high priest, once a year on the Day of Atonement, would go into the Holy of Holies, take the blood of the bulls, the goats, and would sprinkle it on the wings of the angels or the cherubims that were pointed toward each other, and he would take the remaining of the blood and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. The mercy seat was a shadow of what was going to come. Jesus Christ is our mercy seat in the sense that the blood has to be shed. See how that works? Amen. But then the blood, now watch what the mercy seat is, it's designed, I wish I could draw a picture of it. The Ark of the Covenant, and then there's on top of the Ark of the Covenant, or inside the Ark of the Covenant, there are the, the laws of the commandment. Okay? So you've got the law of God inside. Look at this table. The, the law of the covenant is inside, but on top there's a mercy seat. The blood has to be sprinkled so that it covers the mercy seat, but God's mercy is higher than his law. Amen. Ooh, that close right there. You ought to thank God that God's got more mercy than he's got law. And so the blood shed covered up. Who are in the ark, if you will. But those outside the ark, they got the law to deal with. And you don't want the law. Because the law condemns. The law says, you're not ready. The law says, now if you get everything right, you can be saved. But if you do one thing wrong, I know that's right. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. Get that Galatians 3. Watch this. We close Galatians 13. Watch what the Bible says. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do. You got 613 things. Now you think you can do all 613 things? And I'm just going to go on. I don't know if I just had done broken one of the Ten Commandments. Amen. 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 